Let's get started again. Um, this panel is views from the field. We have on our uh, committee members uh, in this for this panel are Mr. Neil McBride, uh, Mr. Ruben Kahn, Ms. Catherine Rowe, and the Honorable Judge John Gerard. Uh, for our actual panel participants, we have Teresa Duncan, New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. Professor Barbara Creel, Law and Indigenous Peoples <coughs> Program at the University of New Mexico, and E. Jerry Morris, President of NACDL. Uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Duncan, and your opening statement. Thank you. Um, I, I know that you all read the written statement I provided to you, and so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association first. We are the only criminal defense lawyer, local criminal defense lawyer association in New Mexico. We're a voluntary professional association of both private lawyers and public defenders, state and federal. Our, real, our goal is to empower our members to represent their clients as effectively as possible. We have approximately 600 members in the state of New Mexico. Uh, most, if not all, of the state public defenders are members of our organization. Many federal public defenders also are members of NMCDLA and participate in our different activities. Um, of the 100 Albuquerque panel members, approximately 66% are members of NMCDLA. For the panel members in Las Cruces, there are 35 of them. I believe the percentage is lower. It's about 46% um, in, the, in the southern part of the state. We provide a variety of services to our members. We provide training approximately eight times a year, eight different seminars. We stagger them around the state. We're a pretty widespread state, a lot of rural communities, and so we try to make our training available to as many people as possible. We do a lot of training in Albuquerque and Las Cruces, which are two centers, also Santa Fe, Roswell, Farmington, so throughout the state. Um, our training is really balanced between state and federal practice. So occasionally, I think once every couple of years, we'll do training that is solely federal practice, and then for each of our, our um, regional training programs, we tend to have both federal and state topics. Uh, we also provide a brief bank for our members, which includes um, briefs, motions submitted by our members. Those include both federal and state pleadings. I don't think that we break out federal pleadings in the brief bank. I think it's more by topic, whether it's a motion to suppress, uh, child sex crimes, um, drug crimes, that sort of thing. We provide a strike force for our members who find themselves um, at the, uh, um, with a judge not being particularly pleased at something that they're doing. It happens more often in state court where we run into these, rural, again, rural communities where lawyers have, um, there, there's few lawyers in a community, they have multiple cases and they end up can't be in two courtrooms at once and some, you know that becomes a problem and so we'll step in to represent them. Um, I th you know, one of the things that, that I'd like to emphasize today as we talk is NMCDLA is very, very eager to work with the Federal Defender Organization, with the training division, and with this, community, this committee to assist in improving CJA representation in New Mexico, um, whether it is to work more closely with the Federal Defender in training to meet our CJA plans for our requirement every year, to act as an intermediary with the court on CJA issues. We have members of NMCDLA in our board uh, and our leadership who are federal practitioners but are not CJA members who would be willing to, to meet with CJA members to, to learn those concerns and to meet with the judiciary in a way that may um, allow more openness than a CJA lawyer would be willing to do if face to face with a particular judge. I wanted to uh, address the issue of training and also resources in the context of what Mr. Williams brought up this morning about client-focused sentencing. I mean, we know that federal cases do come to sentencing in over 90% of those cases, and that I, I, I could not agree more that being bound by the sentencing guidelines does our clients a huge disservice, and that we as a community could use a lot more training on client-focused representation, on learning how to understand our clients and how to get the court to understand our clients. And New Mexico is an incredibly diverse state. We're very fortunate in that way. But there are some gaps in training. And uh, I met with several CJA lawyers prior to coming here today to sort of get a sense of what was working and wasn't, what wasn't working. And unanimously, one of the things that CJA lawyers have a concern about is a lack of cultural awareness, given the diversity of cultures in this state. Um, 
So a lack of, of just general training and also a lack of training from people from within those communities. It's something that we desperately need um, in having a relationship with our clients to build our cases and then also to explain um, or to, to, to introduce the judiciary to our clients in deciding sentencing. And I think the problem, it's, it's a problem both of training and also of resources. And the resources are in part that, you know, the, the CJA panel would like to have a lot more service providers from within local communities. Um, so right now, I know for myself, I have um, some cases up with the Navajo Nation. I'm using an investigator who has experience in that area, but he is not a member of that community. Um, and so while I appreciate his work, I, I would definitely benefit working with someone local who I think would know the people there, would know the cultural issues that I don't know and could help educate me, and I think would definitely serve my client much better. Um, the other part of it with resources is educating the judiciary and the amount of time it takes for us to build trust with some of our clients. Um, we, you know, we, and that's sort of two issues. There's the cultural differences and there's also just the time. So we used to have a um, detention facility in downtown Albuquerque. So you know, most of us from Albuquerque could just walk across the street and go visit our clients. Our clients are now being detained in facilities around the state that are, um, I think the closest one's a half an hour from Albuquerque and the other two are an hour from Albuquerque. So every time we go to see our client, we're building, we're billing an hour to two hours of travel time. And for me, I visit my clients quite a bit. And sometimes it's for a very short period. I have some discovery. I just need to sit down, show my client what it is. I don't want to mail it to them. I want to sit down and say, here, this is what I need you to do with the discovery. And so I'll travel for two hours for a meeting with my client that lasts 30 minutes. Um, and that can be a concern. But it, it, to, in my opinion, as a defense lawyer who's been practicing for th 13 years, 15 years, um, that is absolutely critical. To, to preparing my defense and then to sitting down with my client at the end of the case and asking them to trust me to make a hard decision about whether or not to enter into a plea. And without doing that, that groundwork of just regularly going out to visit my client, I, I just, I don't think I would be as successful um, in developing the relationship with my client and getting them to provide me the information that I need to do um, effective representation. Um, so, I think that those are really my two points to make um, in the opening statement are that one, I would really like to see more resources towards training, developing community relationships among CJA lawyers and community members, and also just to offer NMCDLA as a partner in improving training and also communication with the court uh, in New Mexico. Thank you very much. Professor Priya. Good morning. Welcome to Indian Country. I want to thank uh, Your Honor for inviting me uh, to speak, um, Your Honors at the table, um, and also uh, Autumn Dickman for uh, coordinating this testimony today. I, I'm Barbara Creel. I'm an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Jemez, one of the 19 Pueblos and among the 23 Indian nations in the state of New Mexico. I am an, a former assistant federal public defender and I teach in the Southwest Indian Law Clinic where I represent Native Americans in tribal, state, and federal court. I, am, I have worked with Natives who bring their cases before the federal court under Section 25 USC, Section 1303, federal, Indian Federal Habeas Corpus. And I've worked in and among um, the CJA panel both as an attorney uh, in the Federal Defender's Office and um, as a practicing attorney and, and a law professor. And I want to thank you for asking for information on the Indian country community um, in the representation of Native Americans. This is a really important issue, not just to me, uh, especially um, as I study the right to counsel for um, Indians in tribal and federal court, but for the administration of justice um, in general in the United States. Indians are hailed into federal court differently than any other race in the American system. They are hauled from the Indian reservations into federal court many miles away to face uh, allegations, prosecution, and sentencing under a foreign system. This, uh, fortunately, is countered by access to justice under the Criminal Justice Act, whether it be a federal uh, defender or a panel attorney. Unfortunately, because of the gaps in the culture, there is also a gap in justice. 
My comments focus on the need for training of federal defenders and the CJA panel in general on cultural issues, cultural competency and literacy, but also the substantive underlying law in federal Indian law and the intersection with criminal law. This is important to protect natives' rights in federal court because although they get an, an assistant defender, much of what has come before in the case happened in tribal court where they aren't entitled to uh, an attorney as a matter of constitutional guarantee um, or even statutory right. In tribal court, you have a right to access an attorney, to have uh, an attorney if you can afford one, unless you are a non-Indian appearing in tribal court under the Violence Against Women Act special domestic criminal jurisdiction. This is a huge disparity among races. Um, not all tribes can afford uh, to provide defenders, and when they do, they might be a tribal advocate and a non-law trained defender. The tribal advocate that I worked with at the Warm Springs Indian Reservation in Oregon was invaluable. She was helpful in every way. Um, as Ms. Duncan was saying, someone who knew the community, knew the, the ge geography, knew where to find witnesses, and knew the culture um, was so essential to my investigation and putting on um, jury trials, which we did regularly in that tribal court. Um, what they couldn't do is protect natives um, who appear in tribal courts without an attorney from the overreaching that might happen in an investigation by the FBI or the BIA um, or other tribal police. When the investigation is initiated on the reservation, it's unclear which laws apply, and that ju justice gap allows for um, Miranda rights and Sixth and Fifth Amendment rights to counsel to be obliterated before the case comes to the federal court. Um, these uh, particular instances are documented in, in cases like uh, United States versus Doherty and United States versus Swift Talk out of South Dakota, where the judge was admonishing um, all of the people, all the federal um, agencies involved, for knowing that um, the Sixth Amendment right to counsel applied, but there were um, some questions about when when uh, persons were given their right their Miranda warnings and and um, when the right to counsel triggered. There's also a need for robust diversity in the federal court system. When I testified before the Indian Law and Order Commission, Judge Martha Vasquez of uh, United States District Court of New Mexico said that scarcity is a problem. She is credited for being the only. Um, person in the federal court system that we know of that held uh, a trial in Indian country to allow access to the witnesses and um, family members and the community to be available um, both to testify um, for the defense and the prosecution. But she also said that there's a problem with Native Americans being just defendants in the courtroom because, um, and I would agree with that, that as a, an Indian woman being the only Native in the system that I knew of um, was a real problem because of the culture within the federal system. Already being taken out of um, the Indian reservations under the Major Crimes Act, Indians are seen as this lawless body um, that hails back to um, some stereotypes. And it impacted the access to justice, both in bail release hearings and um, throughout the evidence portion and even into, into sentencing. Natives need to be able to un, be known and understood both um, as people um, who are competent and can appear in court in other capacities as judges, as defenders, as prosecutors, um, as pretrial services officers, as bailiffs, and not just um, the, the criminals as, as they're seen. There's a need for specialized training in representing Native Americans that would encompass basic federal Indian law and jurisdiction, but also the special nuances of um, the regional areas. Uh, the 566 tribes are very different. The Pueblos being different from the Navajo and the Mescalero Apaches, even in, in and among New Mexico. Um, also specialized training in uh, Indian country cases to include all of the 3553 factors in sentencing um, because it's rare that a native's background 
isn't um, part of the reasons he or she is held before, for, before the court. So the nature and circumstances of the case on the reservation and the history, background, and characteristics of the Indian individual are really important. But um, the federal defender can also always access those cultural aspects that might be appropriate in um, both defense and sentencing mitigation without the help of training and access to people within the community um, that are willing to help. I know the committee will have questions and I'm happy to answer um, and I hope I've raised some issues also today that you haven't thought about before. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to address you and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers certainly welcomes the opportunity to provide input. I, I know that you've all received the report that we've issued and uh, I know you'll have questions about that. Let me give you a little bit of information about my background that might give you some idea where I might be of help. I've, pract I've just finished my 38th year as a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, looking forward to several more. I have uh, a state and a federal practice. My practice is, federal practice is primarily in the Western District in the Austin Division. Uh, there was a lot of discussion yesterday about the Austin Division. As I travel around, I seem to be called upon frequently to try to explain in rational terms why we do things as we do in Texas. I do that a lot with limited success, but I will certainly attempt to again if, if you have questions. Uh, I have been president of my local criminal defense bar association, my state bar association, Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, and I'm now president of the National Association. Uh, in addition to that, I've been, been involved in indigent defense reform. Uh, most recently, and this may be of interest to you, uh, I've been uh, somewhat instrumental uh, or a part of the effort to establish a fairly unique system of assigned counsel in Travis County, Austin, Texas, in the state system. Uh, it's patterned after the pilot program in San Mateo, California, that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, the only three that I know of that are up and running are San Mateo, Lubbock, Texas, and, and Austin. Uh, just to give you a brief overview, and then I'll get back to what's at hand here. We have a nonprofit organization that's managed by defense lawyers that determines who receives court appointments, how they're compensated within some statutory limits, uh, determines the qualifications of the lawyers that will receive the appointments, uh, provides expert assistance, encourages them to use expert assistance, uh, provides investigators, and generally, and requires CLE, uh, set standards for areas of CLE that the lawyers must complete. And we generally manage the private lawyers who take court appointments. The equivalent would be, of course, the CJA panel. Um, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers is, uh, we have about 9,200 direct, direct members uh, through our affiliated state associations, we represent a total of about 40,000 criminal defense lawyers. Our, our mission is to ensure that each person or each entity accused of a criminal offense in any court receives adequate representation regardless of their financial status. Uh, for the last 25 years, we've been particularly involved in indigent defense reform, and that effort has escalated in the last few years. Uh, we, of course, like every organization that's examined it, are distraught about the, the state of indigent defense in the state courts. But the federal, def federal uh, defender service, the federal defense system, has always been held as a gold standard. It's always been the system that the state organizations looked up to. Uh, they, it provides quality representation in federal courts. The, the, the representation provided by the institutional public defenders is second to none. Uh, CJA panels, uh, we've discussed some of the issues. We think that that can be elevated to the same level. We adhere to and support the ABA 10 principles of a robust criminal defense, indigent defense system. Uh, number one in that of those principles is independence of the defense function. Number two is that any good system must have a robust both institutional 
public defender system as well as uh, involvement by the private bar. Um, although generally the, the federal system has been held to be the gold standard, there were, there were many that, that were, were concerned about the lack of independence from the judiciary. Uh, those problems became very manifest in 2013 with the sequester crisis, and I'll deem it a crisis because it was. Uh, during that crisis, there was a feeling in, among the defender uh, community that when the money got tight, that the judiciary looked after itself more than the defenders, and that uh, the defenders who had long relied upon the judiciary to be their advocates with Congress for funding were let down. Uh, a lot of defenders came to us and said, will you help us? And we, we took active steps in Congress. Uh, the defenders also did. There was a, a bipartisan group in Congress that very much supported the defenders in their, in their budget fights. Uh, we also formed the committee, the task force, that produced the report that you have. We, we noted that uh, the last comprehensive study of, of the federal indigent defense system had taken place more than 20 years ago, even though when the system was set up in 1970, uh, the main part was set up, the, the thought was it would be reviewed every seven years or so. We felt that it was important that we undertake a review and that that review be comp comprehensive and also be from the standpoint of the defender. And that's what we did. Um, the methodology that we used was we did some 130 uh, interviews with defenders, uh, people employed by public defenders offices, CJA panel members, court personnel, AO personnel, all the stakeholders in the, uh, in the system. Uh, as you know, many of those interviews are anonymous. Many of the people that we spoke to spoke to us on a condition of anonymity. Um, our task force also reviewed, um, I couldn't begin to estimate how many volumes of materials, but quite a few. I know the task force members per, uh, personally, they were very dedicated to this task. Um, after the review, after considering all the evidence, all the interviews, we came up with what I think is a fair assessment of the state of the federal defense system. And we also came up with some recommendations. The key finding of our recommendation and the key, the, the key issue that, that concerns us is the lack of independence of the, of the federal criminal uh, indigent defense system from the judiciary. And let me talk about that just a minute, and I know you'll have questions about it, but we're, what is our concern there? Why, why did the ABA in 2002 make that their first principle, that the system should be independent? Should be independent? Why did the committee, Senate committee in 1970, uh, basically state it would be wrong for the judiciary to control the indigent defense function? They set it up merely as an interim me measure. But why, why did the Prado Commission conclude that the function should be moved out of the AO uh, nominally remain in the judiciary, but it, as an independent agency. What is the problem? Well, the problem is that there, there are very distinct functions within the criminal justice system. Uh, three distinct functions. There's the prosecution, the, the judiciary, and the defense. Those functions have different objectives. The sole objective of the criminal defense lawyer is to provide the best defense for his or her client that they can. We look at the decisions that we make from that perspective. We view the criminal justice system through that lens. Uh, part of it is the job description. Maybe a big part of it is. We're tasked constitutionally and certainly by uh, by other legal precedent with that job to put our client first. 
Uh, so decisions, for instance, and I'll just touch on a few of them. Uh, for instance, about whether or not we, we hire an expert. That's not primarily, in the first instance, an economic decision with us. That is a decision based upon what we think is in the best interest of our client. And frankly, that decision may turn out to be a dead end. But it was something that we needed to explore. Uh, we've heard, I've had the benefit of sitting through uh, both days of testimony, we've heard reference made to judges thinking, well, that particular expert is not uh, necessary. Well, wh what is the basis of that decision? Where does that decision come from? That decision comes from the judge's role as a judge. Uh, that role is very different. And in addition to the role, let me, let me suggest to you that we are different, that there is something about criminal defense lawyers that are different from prosecutors and from judges. Uh, they may, that difference may develop later in their career, but we are different. I can no more explain to you why I look at things the way I do than I can explain to you why I'm left-handed. I just do. But I can tell you that I do look at things differently. So, and I'll elaborate on this uh, more as I go along, but that, that was the main finding. That was our main concern, is this lack of independence. Um, and when I say independence, I'm talking about independence of function, not necessarily independence in a float in an organizational chart, although that may affect function. But we're, we're talking about the independent ability to make decisions that are in the interest of our clients, and if those decision, decisions are reviewed. Uh, for voucher cutting or for appropriateness of a request, that those be reviewed by someone who looks at those through the same lens that we do. And if that is denied, that request or that voucher, that that person will sit down with us and explain from the perspective of the defense function why that decision was made. Uh, several years ago, we had a lawyer that decided that Title 18 had been wrongfully enacted, and he filed numerous motions to that effect. I would have cut his voucher uh, if, if that had come to me. But there are other things that may sound as, as wild to other members of this three-part three process I'm talking about that, that eventually have borne fruit. Uh, but again, I think it's important to look at it from the defense function. We developed in our report uh, seven fundamentals of a robust in federal engine defense system. Control over federal engine defense services must be insulated from judicial interference. I've, I've touched on that briefly. The federal engine defense system must be adequately funded. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Engine defense council must have the requisite expertise to provide representation consistent with the best practices in the legal profession. I think gone are the days when it, it would be adequate, I'll just use that word, for a, a judge to look over the roster of the lawyers that are licensed to practice in you know, his or her division and say, well, you know, I'm going to get old so-and-so to do this case. Well, I'm sure they'll do a good job. They do a good job on the environmental cases that they've brought to me. Uh, the, the federal, federal criminal defense has just become too complicated, too specialized. Uh, the lawyers that handle those cases should have expertise and training uh, in that area of the law. Uh, it must, the training must be comprehensive, ongoing, and readily available. We're talking about that uh, this morning. Decisions regarding vouchers, payments to panel attorneys must be made promptly by an entity outside of judicial control. I touched on that in, in, when I was speaking about independence. The inherent conflict we've, we've talked about, uh, so I won't go into it in any depth of my opening remarks. The inherent conflict 
it's there. Uh, if the lawyer who regularly practices in, in your courts or in a court uh, has to go to the judge who's heard the case, uh, who there may be an opportunity or maybe an occasion that, are, that arises in a trial or a pretrial where that lawyer is in opposition to the judge on some ruling, uh, may forcefully be in opposition, may, may put forth some uh, defense that the judge may not think has merit, but there may be a very good reason from the defense lawyer's standpoint from putting forth that defense. It, it, it's simply a chilling effect on the, the function of defense counsel to know that they're going to have to go to that same judge, or to any judge, frankly, uh, to justify their their voucher. Um, the federal engine defense system must include greater transparency. Yeah, I've, I've read this report several times. And let me tell you, the, the, hard, the, the hardest thing for me to figure out from reading this report is how the decisions get made in the judiciary that affect indigent defense. And I, I assume there's somebody somewhere that can tell me, probably has command of it, I don't yet, how a budget request is initiated uh, that, that affects a public federal defender's office, what committees that goes through, how it eventually gets to Congress, and who presents it to Congress. Uh, and as we've, as we've documented in our report, and as we've, you've discussed here, that's changed. Uh, 2012, uh, there was a drastic change in how that how that uh, system operates, and it, it, there there needs to be greater transparency into how as to how those decisions are made. Fun, funding being one of them, uh, policy decisions in general affecting federal engine defense, and lastly, a comprehensive independent review of this program. Uh, CGA program must address the serious concerns addressed in this report, and that is your committee. We, of course, formulated this, this recommendation before this committee was formed, and we're, we're pleased to, to see that, that that is taking place. These aren't radical concepts. Uh, there's nothing in here that, that is groundbreaking. Most of it is reformation in some in some respect of the ABA principles. Uh, this is this is not new stuff. Further reflections on how the how the report was put together. One thing that we discovered uh, was put it bluntly, the fear that exists among the federal criminal defense bar. Uh, as far as speaking out about their concerns about engine defense, primarily with the CGA panel, but some with the public defender's offices also. Rightly or wrongly, the perception is that if they speak out, if they request experts that they think that the judge won't approve or will be looked unfavorably on, if they submit vouchers that challenge the, the statutory limit, that that will be viewed unfavorably by the judge, and somehow that will impact either their practice or the ultimate result in their cases. They want to get along. Uh, voucher cutting is an issue. We've documented some cases in our report. There is, I guess, what I would call de facto voucher cutting that's widespread. We know it's not going to get approved, so we're just not going to bother to submit it. Um, factors such as uh, voucher cutting or, or not allowing billing for visitation of clients in remote detention areas. Uh, discouraging, and I'm not sure, I, I have some insight to how this happens, but I think it's obvious it does happen, discouraging the use of, ex, of uh, investigators. Uh, we think that, that this is somewhat a product of this culture that has grown up of fear or apprehension or whatever you want to call it about swimming upstream in the system. Um, independence, we think at a minimum, should mean that the judges should not be involved in selection, setting of staffing levels, and funding of federal defender organizations. Uh, the appointment, the selection of who's on the CJA panel, and the ultimate appointment of private 
attorneys to represent defendants and the payment of those attorneys. Um, and let me let me do this. I was uh, very interested in, in uh, Mr. Friendsley's questioning the other day, make your case for why uh, a particular aspect of the system ought to be changed. Let me throw this out for, for consideration, either with this panel or uh, you know, later on in your discussions. Given the distinct position that the defense the distinct role that the defense plays as opposed to the other two stakeholders in the system. Uh, given the recommendation of the Senate committee, given the ABA uh, guidelines, given the findings of Prado committee, why should the judges be involved in these processes? What is the reasoning why a judge should be involved in staffing a public defender's office. Why is it that a judge should be involved or the circuit should be involved in selecting the public defender? Why should a judge be involved in determining who is on the CJA panel and in determining the payment? Um, what, is the, what is the interest being served? And I'm not suggesting that that interest is somehow nefarious. What I'm suggesting is that it is an interest that is not in line with the defense function, that is more than likely perhaps in line with function of one of the other uh, interests of the stakeholders. Um, let me address with you, uh, and I'm about to wrap up with this part of it, the issue that I said I come back to the funding, and this ties in with the placement of the indigent defense function within within the federal government. Um, there is consensus that the defense function among defenders that the defense function should be independent. There is not a consensus, although the majority believes according to our, our work, that the defense function should be removed from the AO and should perhaps be uh, structured as was the recommendation of the Prado Commission, nominally left in the judiciary. We have to fit it somewhere in the organizational tree. But as, a, as an independent organization like the Sentencing Guideline Commission or the uh, Federal Judicial Center, um, but the fear in doing that, the, those that that don't agree with that move, first of all, they all agree that at a minimum, the a, the Defender Services Office should be re-elevated to its former position within EAO. But those that don't agree it should be an independent agency are concerned about funding. They're concerned, as one of the panelists said yesterday, about becoming the next Planned Parenthood. Uh, I don't share that fear. Perhaps, perhaps it's because my ox is not in that particular ditch. Uh, I don't draw a government check. But I do have some familiarity with the atti current attitudes in Congress about indigent defense. Uh, we're, we as an organization, we're there every day and we're talking to members and members staff uh, for instance, uh, in the last six months, Senator Grassley has held a committee hearing on the state of indigent uh, defense in, in misdemeanor courts in the United States. Uh, who would have thought a year ago such a hearing would have been held? During the sequestration uh, fights, as I said earlier, there was a bipartisan uh, group of, of legislators that were very much in support of the defender function. There are members in Congress that would favor a removal of the defense function and placing it outside of the AO. Uh, I think that maybe the fear is a bit unfounded, but you never know until you start running the traps, until you start talking with people who, uh, who make those decisions in Congress. So, I think 
Excuse me, I hate to cut you off, but I'm going to ask you to wrap it up because I know. We yeah, have a lot to I, I agree, and I'm this. This is the punchline. What I would urge this committee to do is to determine what it believes to be the best practices, what it believes would be the best system for federal engine defense without regard initially to whether or not it could be practically presented to Congress, whether or not it would pass, and then let them move into the second phase of uh, gaining support for it. That's all I have. Mr. Khan. Let me start with you, Mr. Morris. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and, and I highlighted the, the, the comments in your written testimony about the pervasive fear. Um, and of course, the thing about fear, people who are afraid, is they also won't tell you they're afraid and that that's the reason they're not talking about things. And, you know, but one of the problems we face is, as a committee is not just coming up with what we think is happening and what we think is the best system, but with getting evidence of the problems. Um, and so do you have any suggestions on how we can document both the fear that's preventing people from saying out loud what they believe to be true and documenting what they believe to be true about these things when they're not saying them to us? Since we need this on the record. And can NACDL do anything to help us? Well, they say what we can't do. We, we can't uh, violate the confidence that we assured the people that talked to us that we, if we assured we wouldn't release their their names. Um, it's possible, uh, I suppose, that we could we could go back and ask some of those if they would individuals if they would agree to speak on the record. Um, it, uh, I don't know of, don't know the mechanism of this committee or what mechanism this committee would have. It could be that this committee could could uh, talk to some people in closed session. Would NACDL be willing to consider reviewing its archives of material that it collected during the, the compilation of the report and producing some sort of anonymized uh, version of the specific comments so that we could at least have access to those? I'll discuss that with the task force and, and uh, with my executive committee and see if we'll do that. Let me ask you another question about, you know, you've, you, you've talked in the abstract about structures that might be acceptable. Do you have a specific recommendation about how we, how, how would you structure an indigent, indigent defense program if you were starting with a clean sheet of paper? I, I don't have a specific recommendation. I have a, a several specific uh, things to consider. I think it's important that whatever uh, structure that, that is ultimately put in place that there's consensus among defenders that it's the correct structure. So I think the, the next phase after you just decide some general parameters would be to work to the details. But for instance with the CJA, CJA panel, um, CJA panel I believe should be uh, administered not by the court but by some sort of uh, administrative structure separate from the judiciary and separate from the public defender's office. Uh, Why on that latter point? Because there seems to be a fair amount of support for the idea that federal defenders can manage panels well. Well, I think there, there may be an inherent conflict there. Most of the cases that I'm involved with where there is a public defender um, and there are CJA lawyers involved, the reason is because the, there's a conflict. Public defender is represented either another defendant that's indicted or a cooperating individual. Uh, it may be that, uh, that that conflict would be serious enough and the something, of course, the committee would have to think about that you would want to place the administration of the panel uh, with a separate administrator, much as we've done with the state system in, in Austin. Ms. Duncan, can I put the same question to you? Do you or your organization have a view of what you think the appropriate structure should be? I mean, it's, it's hard for me to answer that question, any kind of specifics. I'll tell you that we recently um, had an overhaul of our state public defender system. For a long time, our state public defender was appointed by our governor. And through the efforts of the criminal defense bar and generally in NMCDLA, we moved it 
um, to an independent organization. It's now the law office of the public defender, separate from both the courts and also from the executive. Um, in terms of taking it outside of the federal public defender office, I share Mr. Morse's concern about potential conflicts. I do think that I'm not sure what percentage of the CJA cases that we get are because of conflicts with the public defender. Um, I know a lot of my cases are just individual defendants, but perhaps the idea that was brought up earlier from the earlier panel of some sort of a committee that includes multiple parties so that when you do have those issues of a, of a conflict, it's someone outside the federal defender organization um, who's looking over CJA work. I could can, can I ask a follow-up, Ruben, with that? I want to ask specifically because I'm familiar with the uh, uh, San Mateo County uh, model, and I, and I was wondering, uh, is, is that at least a type of structure that uh, that you think this committee can be looking at uh, as a model? And, and one of the reasons I ask is, I, I believe the San Mateo model county has a, when there is a conflict, they have a separate conflict office. I don't know if Austin does that or... Um, but, but I want to ask you about, on structure, are you looking at a structure that would be similar uh, to that as far as a model? This is me speaking, not uh, in ACGL, it? but yes, and I'm, I'm very much involved in that. I mean, we're looking at all kinds of yeah. alternatives, so I mean, yeah. we want to drill down to what, what you're really looking at, and if the answer is yes, the, I would be asking you why. Yeah, I, th I think yes, and, I th and why? Because mm -hmm. I think... Uh, that addresses uh, all the concerns that we've talked about in the last day and a half. Uh, the, the lawyers are supervised, there are, there are performance standards, there are minimum standards for them coming into the panel, there's required CLE, there's performance evaluations that are done uh, by experienced attorneys who actually observe them in court. How often are they done? Uh, well, they're, they're done, uh, it, it's ongoing. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't give you a, a frequency, it's, it's there are three staff members that do it, and we have four. Every other year. Right. Yeah. right. Well, it's, it's ongoing. We, And I'm, I'm on the committee that reviews uh, complaints, so we get complaints frequently that come in either from those reviews or from clients or from the courts sometimes. So, yeah, I think it's a good system. I'm sorry. Mr. McBride. Oh, did you have a follow-up? No, no, no. I was just saying that. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I know you're familiar with the system, too. Yeah, no, I do so have I one question about the system, and then let me hand it over to Neil. If you can just tell me, to, in a general way, to whom is that system then accountable? I mean, ultimately, we all serve somebody. Who, who watches them? Just the, just the legislature and the budget committees? No, there's, there's, uh, there's two levels of oversight. There's uh, uh, a... a uh, Citizens Committee that has members from various stakeholders uh, in the minority community and, and other communities that is functions as an advisory committee to a nonprofit corporation. The nonprofit has a board, and all of the board members are defense lawyers. Uh, ultimately, we have uh, guidelines uh, as far as minimum payments, maximum payments, or, uh, uh, presumptive maximum payments. And, and qualifications of lawyers that are set by uh, the, what we call the criminal justice, the Fair Defense Act. The judges get together and they say, we want lawyers to handle a particular type of case to have X amount of experience. Uh, then my committee reviews those uh, recommendations from the judges and we may raise them. And we have raised them in, in certain instances. The funding uh, comes partially from the state, partially from the county commissioners. Ultimately, we've had to make our case more often to the county commissioners as to whether the system is working uh, or, or not. And part of the pushback we had uh, is we excluded some of the lawyers who had been getting court appointments for a long time from, from the uh, eligibility. Those lawyers went to the commissioners and complained about it, and we expected that. So we, we met those complaints with the commissioners. Thanks, Judge Cardone. Um, first, a question for uh, for Mr. Morrison, picking up on what Mr. Kahn was asking you. Um, I'm, I may have misunderstood you, Mr. Morris, but I thought you said when you were discussing sort of structure issues in your opening statement, you, you said with respect to the Defender Service that it has to fit somewhere within the organizational structure uh, of the judiciary. And I just want to uh, push back on that. Um, 
I'm looking at your your prepared testimony, which which I thought was was very well done, and, and you quote from the legislative history from a Senate committee report 1970, where Congress was thinking out loud about various options. And, and they conclude by saying, quote, it would be just as inappropriate to place direction of the defender system in the judicial arm of the U.S. government as it would be for the prosecutorial arm, uh, end quote. And um, that struck me as being, you know, exactly right. Uh, I think as a matter of, of separation of powers, while defenders are not, you know, part of the executive branch, like, like prosecutors, they're certainly not part of the judiciary branch. And so... I, I just stepped down after after four years as the United States Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia. And if I woke up one day and somebody said, "By the way, um, you know, Judge Cardone here is going to be approving, you know, your, um, your your you know your staffing and your and your investigations in national security cases, terrorism cases, organized crime cases, um, et cetera," uh, I, I, you know, there'd be a revolt. I, I can't imagine a, a prosecutor that would ever agree to a system in which. Essentially, their boss, even with a small b, is a judge. Likewise, I can't imagine a judge ever agreeing to a system in which, in some you know uh, way, a prosecutor was was signing off on something they do. So, putting aside you know rail politic or the art of the possible, just as a matter of first principle, why would you ever agree that the defender service should be housed within the judiciary as opposed to some sort of an independent agency like the SEC or the uh, you know, the PCAOB or the CFPB. I mean, Congress has created uh, no shortage of independent agencies in the last decade that are just housed floating, you know, outside the three branches of government. Now, I, I think when you take the political considerations out of it, uh, the, the Senate's comments in 1970 were, were the better uh, model. And what was, select, what was suggested there was something like a Defender General's office. Uh, I think the... Um, Judge Prado certainly can can tell you whether this is true or not. I think that perhaps the Prado Commission's uh, um, recommendation that it be still that it still remain nominally in the judiciary was more uh, uh, in recognition of the political practicalities. But I think that certainly the in, in a perfect world it ought to be outside of the judiciary. Okay, and then Professor Creel, I had a, a question for you. Um, you wrote in your, your prepared uh, testimony that you wrote the Criminal Justice Act is founded a, upon parity between prosecution by the U.S. Attorney and the defense and the noble ideal that finances should not impact access to justice. I think that's exactly right. And I will say that when I was uh, U.S. Attorney, I had long conversations with, with uh, my counterpart, the, the federal defender in, in Virginia, and I always got the sense um, that we never compared numbers, that we just had a whole lot more money in the bank uh, than, than he did. Um, and even with the caveat that there were lots of things that we did where he was not, quote, on the other side, you know, we had national security investigations that never resulted in our prosecution. We defended the government as, as civil defense attorneys in programmatic challenges. But, but in terms of sort of this, the, the, the common area of the Venn diagram between our offices, I just had the sense that I had a whole lot more resources. Uh, than Michael Nachmanoff did. And so my question, this kind of jumped out in your testimony, but I'm wondering if you're aware of any efforts by either, you know, the AO or any, you know, sort of outside uh, entity, academic or, or otherwise, to try and do some apple-to-apple -apple comparison of, um, you know, of, of, of funding streams, of uh, responsibilities, of caseloads, to try and compare, you know, in a typical district, for example, sort of what, on an apple-to-apple -apple basis, what the U.S. Attorney's resources are versus what the corresponding FPD and CJA resources are in, in that, you know, parallel, symmetrical um, sets of responsibilities, just to see whether, anecdotally, you know, it, it's right, and, and what is the gap, and, and what does the data show? I'm just curious if, if you're aware of that. I'm not aware of any studies that have... Um try to look at apples to apples in terms of the funding pools of money for the U.S. Attorney's Office and uh, Federal Defender Services. Um, and when I speak about parity, I was, I was speaking about it in um, much broader terms, both the financial resources, um, but then how those financial resources get allocated with regard to Indian country and what specific necessities might be um, Im imperative for parity. Um, so it was, I thought really a lot about what you're asking at its core.
before and um, went through what the U.S. Attorney's Office has um, in addition to the DEA and the ATF and the uh, FBI um, in Indian country, what makes it um, even more desperate and um, outlined some of the um, initiatives under the U.S. Attorney's Office um, that they are boasting about for their unprecedented um, crime and punishment initiatives to make up for the lack of justice um, that has arisen on Indian reservations. And many of these issues come from social issues that um, come out in the criminal justice system. Alcohol, um, the lack of treatment, uh, it never gets um, talked about. Um, but that is the core of most of the, the cases that I saw off the Indian reservations and in um, all of the other factors that we're talking about that lead to someone being in the federal criminal justice system. Um, the, the Tribal Law and Order Act asked for specifically um, efforts after consultation with tribes into alternatives to incarceration. And the U.S. Attorney's Office hasn't, uh, or the Department of Justice hasn't, um, I think, paid any, enough attention. They, they did a report on some of the ish things that they could do, but that's something that a Defender Service Office could look into um, if it was separate and distinct and had, had the funding that would provide initiatives that would keep um, people out of uh, jail and into programs that might be more helpful. Um, so the type of study that you're you're looking for would be um, a great asset, maybe could be requested through um, the GAO that's done some excellent reports on um, uh, specific questions from Congress. Uh, Professor Creole, my question was for you, and again, kind of just going into further the efforts in Indian country. Uh, over the last several years, as you know, the Department of Justice and Congress have made, had a number of initiatives, Travel Law and Order Act, the Violence Against Women Act, um, all initiatives that either enhance tribal prosecutions or increase their jurisdiction um, or increase the punishments mm -hmm. for Indian people. And I was interested in the, the comments that you made earlier and some of your, and perhaps you could give us some of your suggestions as to why it's important that there be training for whether it be CJA attorneys or assistant federal defenders in the interlap areas, the, the areas of uh, criminal law that interlap or in, intersect, if you will, overlap, intersect with federal law, uh, specifically the dual sovereignty issue and the double jeopardy issue and the, the use of the uncounseled um, convictions. So those kinds of things. And what kind of training you think would be, would be positive, especially in light of all of the training money that has gone to mm -hmm. the Department of Justice for those same issues to prosecute Indians, but not to defend Indians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the independence of the, the defense side, I think that um, we've lost out on, on the training. I've been approached by the Department of Justice to initiate trainings in Indian country and um, have attempted to do some overviews of Indian law, but there aren't any defense specific trainings. Um, the, the ones that are held um, with the Department of Justice include uh, judges, prosecutors, and police officers. And um, we all know that that's not effective defense training. Um, so there's the, the criminal defense training that needs to occur, but then it has to have the overlay of what is different in Indian country, starting with the Major Crimes Act, the difference between the General Crimes Act and the Major Crimes Act. One of the major issues uh, under this racialized uh, law is who is an Indian. Um, that rarely gets raised. Um, there's one case out of the Ninth Circuit, the United States versus Zapeda, where the question came up almost inadvertently and then became um, a real issue, um, challenging basic notions of, of whether the jurisdiction is proper over the person to um, the, the more complex issues of where is Indian country. In New Mexico, Indian country is defined differently than in Oregon or Oklahoma. And so litigating that issue for jurisdiction basis. When the Indian person might be more appropriately punished under the tribal law and um, treated might be helpful um, versus federal court uh, there should be some coordination among the Indian nations on when, uh, uh, in sentencing and mitigation, 
um, the kinds of um, culturally appropriate treatments and um, punishments that might be more um, deferred to um, than the federal sentencing guidelines. Um, again, I think that um, there, there are so many different issues that haven't been explored in um, the Indian individual as a defendant in federal court um, that need to be brought out by these um, brilliant attorneys that need to think about these when they know the difference in, in Indian law. Um, one of my uh, issues is the use of uncounseled convictions in the United States constitutional scheme. That is contrary to to all of our notions of justice within um, the Sixth Amendment embodied in the Fifth Amendment, but only gets applied to Native Americans because they're the only ones that come up to the federal court with prior uncounseled convictions. I sat in recently in a tribal court also where they had a law-trained defense attorney and they were still being routinely um, processed in the, the tribal court because a pleading guilty on the spot, no investigation, um, no discovery, no um, uh, exchange of motions because the individual wanted drug treatment and if they got sentenced to 30 days or more, they could access drug treatment. Well, that's unconstitutional in our terms, but that would come a law trained person, a prior conviction, when that person comes to federal court, um, that could both be the basis of a federal offense and the basis for um, an upward departure under our own uh, thinking in the US Constitution. And that's just not appropriate and um, illegal and I think um, completely dis discriminatory. It could be used against them as an incriminating statement at trial. Exactly. And, and I want to follow up on that, uh, Professor Crew, because one of the things that we want we want to know what we don't know, and this is a unique <laughs> this is a unique opportunity to do that. And I want to know um, what issues that you see are the uh, most urgent in the interaction. And I guess I'm talking macro uh, now between the tribal justice systems and the uh, federal criminal justice system that that the CJA that the Criminal Justice Act can address. Uh, what recommendations? What should we be looking at? You know, what are some of those? issues and what recommendations do you see that would right. be Right. I thought a lot about the scope of your review okay. Okay. Um, and um, diversity yeah. is is one. Um, I think that's one of the first yeah. issues. Um, <coughs> qualified counsel I think is different in Indian country um, cases and that re requires this training that we're talking about. Um, availability of counsel on conflict cases um, the excellent services of the federal defenders um, don't always get spread um, because of conflict cases need to be spread out among the panel attorneys who have this training. The coordination between the tribal case and the federal case is non-existent unless there is someone within the federal defender's office who has gained access and cultivated relationships in and among. Tell the, us about that um, because that, that's an area that is a specific concern. The uh, investigators that I've worked with in, um, in the federal system are excellent in finding the information on the reservation and those that information requires um, a cultural literacy that is beyond just our, our regular law training or investigation training. And that is you're entering a foreign nation. It, it, it requires a, a degree of diplomacy in understanding the group that you're working with and communicating. So being able to find witnesses, find mitigation information, get documents from the Indian Health Service or the BIA schools might be different than finding it um, in your local public school. Um, also, um, just knowing the family relationships in the background might be really helpful both in investigation and in, in mitigation. Um, outside of the defender's office, I think that's much harder to find. Um, and what I really want to focus on is the coordination both of training. Um, there has to be something where we're all of uh, the same trainings are available. I was thinking more of through the through the Federal Judiciary Training Center or this uh, separate Defender Services Office could provide training on Indian country. They're routine and regular on the U.S. Attorney's side. I get a, a notice for a webinar or a local live uh, training um, for uh, Indian country prosecutors and just the general public. And what that 
promotes is this idea that Indians are criminals and um, that they're, it's sort of just this accepted idea because they, they're brought into federal court, they must have done something really serious. What I've found is that there's victims on both sides of the courtroom when I enter it. And if that person who um, is being charged as the defendant now, he had a background and history um, that is the same as the, the person who is being labeled as the victim. Um, it's just a matter of the, the timing of how these um, incidences played out. Uh, there's there's so much that can be learned um, through through cultural literacy and substantive training. So it's not just it's not just a humanitarian idea. There really are specific um, ABA guidelines on how to approach you know different cultures. Um, we mentioned the use of interpreters um, yesterday, and I'm working in the state courts to provide interpreters. Um, a training system for certified interpreters in tribal languages. And um, like uh, Mr. Morris said, we've looked to the federal courts as our, our gold standard, but there aren't any. And so I think that um, interpreters for tribal languages um, are, are a requirement, both in and outside of the courtroom. Mr. Tom? I was asked a follow-up about the training with you, Professor Creel, and that's you know, the, the training division within the Defender Services Office largely facilitates and coordinates training that's provided essentially by defenders to defenders. And so my first question to you is, do you think sufficient expertise exists within the federal defender community to do the sort of training that you think is essential? There are some excellent attorneys. Um, maybe attorney, <laughs> John Sands is, is sort of the lead person in the Ninth Circuit that um, knows the, the Indian issues. And there's, um, there isn't enough diversity, people who uh, come from native backgrounds or have studied Indian law. When I was in law school, we were recruited from the uh, Department of Justice and told as Native Americans, you need to go through the US Attorney's Honors Program. And um, after, outside of law school, I was told you need to become a US Attorney because that's where all the power is. And the, the power is e deciding who gets charged and, and how to protect Indian women and children and how it's being, being sold now. Um, so there, there hasn't been a pipeline for training in this area, even though the Major Crimes Act has existed since 1885. There just isn't that, the same kind of knowledge. And it's because we're such a small po portion of the population. But um, when you look at the incarceration rates and the prosecution rates, um, there's really no no good reason why natives have been ignored in, in the training among federal defenders. Um, we were talking about recruitment in the last panel, and I think that the the culture of elitism in federal court has to has played some part in um, the many attorneys that um, and judges that I've worked with um, don't know what they don't know and so assume that bringing a criminal defense um, or um, a degree of some sort from a specific school was enough to catapult them into being an, an excellent attorney or judge. And um, there needs to be more um, education in the judiciary and, and the bar, the bench and the bar in Indian, Indian law under the Major Crimes Act. Is there, and, and I, you know, pardon me, I just don't know, you know, I'm from California now and we just, you know, the, the case is going to state court, not in the federal court. But have, have there been any efforts to coordinate with academic programs like yours at University of New Mexico or at other universities um, to, to jumpstart this sort of training? Um, not enough. There is the University of Washington who uh, provides an Indian law clinic or an Indian defense clinic in Tulalip. And that was the key piece that allowed Tulalip to become VAWA uh, reauthorization of 2013 project um, that would allow special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. So you had to have both the, def the defense that was law trained and the um, prosecutors. Um, so it, it, it can cut both ways. Um, I think that the training needs to happen and it should, it should involve the universities and um, Indian law programs. I think that's an excellent idea. And I had a similar question for you, but not about Indian law training. But you talked about the training that your organization provides and its willingness to, 
coordinate at least with the federal defenders and with the, the Defender Services Office. Has there been any such coordination, any efforts to work with you in providing training, in, particularly in the rural areas? Um, so, so I don't think it's been particularly organized, but we do work with the federal public defender, Stephen McHugh, and with individual federal defenders to provide training to our membership around the state. So as I mentioned, one of the members of our CLE committee is an assistant federal defender, a current assistant federal defender. Um, in preparing for this hearing, our, our um, CLE committee and our leadership has talked a lot about how do we incorporate these ideas into our, up, you know, to next year's training. So the um, training with respect to Indian law, Indian country cases and obviously working with the university maybe to bring in some different trainers who have more experience in those issues than, um, you know, the usual people who are presenting. So, you know, I, I, we weren't aware until preparing for this hearing that our CJA plan required the four hours of federal um, training. And so that's obviously something that we are going to focus on in 2016 and the years going forward and talking to the federal public defender and hopefully with the judiciary as well on um, what, what does that mean? I mean, what, what would qualify as federal training? Are there issues that are coming up consistently that any NCDLA can help with? So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Judge. Uh, Professor Duncan, um, I chatted earlier with, with Mr. Morris about sort of the judicial oversight and, and wanted to ask you a question less about sort of structure but more of sort of day-to-day, -day, how it plays out sort of in the real world in your experience. And, and the committee's heard both in testimony and as well as, you know, submitted comments sort of a, a litany of, of um, you know, concerning anecdotes of, of CJA uh, lawyers who are concerned that uh, advocating a particular you know, position or argument or motion could could upset uh, a judge, could even jeopardize their uh, place on the panel. Um, sort of, I think the suggestion, and, and I think we may have heard it even on the last panel, of, of inadvertently or otherwise having to essentially provide privileged information, you know, to a judge as part of their review of, of vouchers, um, uh, you know, vouchers being cut or, or full vouchers not being submitted just because, you know, let's, let's not sort of, you know, essentially let's bid against ourselves before the judge, you know, bids against us. Um, we've heard a lot of that. And um, I think it's been almost entirely anecdotal. You know, one thing the committee is, is very interested in is, is data in whatever fashion to try and, you know, put some, something concrete behind the stories we're hearing. Uh, I'm just curious from your experience and, and from your colleagues, if, your experience, your colleagues' experience, uh, have involved, you know, any sort of these, you know, suggestions of, of, of um, you know, where the feeling was a judge, uh, you know, sort of put the lawyer in a, in a tough place in terms of, in, in a way that an AUSA would never, you know, appear before the judge being worried about that their motion is going to, you know, result in, in, in um, you know, some sort of economic result. But just curious if you could talk about what your experience has been here. In talking to CJA members to prepare for the hearing, I heard sort of different, all across the spectrum really, I mean, attorneys who had filed for, like expert requests that were denied and didn't push it because of concern about how the judge was going to react to that deny or to pushing on the issue. But then I, there are also attorneys who when their motions are denied and they feel that the expert's imp important to their case will push back, you know, uh, through an ex parte communication with the judge. Um, so, you know, there, there is, in New Mexico, as there is across the country, some fear in um, pushing issues for which they've previously been denied. I've heard about mitigation specialists, mitigation investigations. Um, the experience is not uniform. I, I, you know, I, I, some attorneys are getting requests funded, some are not, and I think that that may be a function of how requests are being presented to the court, or it could also just be a function of differences in judges, that some judges find particular experts to be relevant and others don't. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think it's really, it comes back down to a training issue on both sides. I think for the, for the CJA lawyers to have a better understanding of how CJA works, what's, what can be funded, what can't be funded, for judges to understand what it really requires for us to represent our clients and how, as Mr. Morris was saying, there are certain avenues that we may need to pursue which never get presented into court, which doesn't make it a waste of time. It was an important thing for us to pursue. And I think about, um, you know, I recently did a capital case and in investigating a client's mental health and their 
family history, you'll engage experts who will you know, point out to you, maybe you should pursue this avenue and you need an expert then to go down that avenue and it may be at the end of it, it's a dead road, uh, you know, a dead end, but it was an important thing to investigate and opened up other areas to present a full picture of your client. Um, so I think, and one of the things that I would really recommend is some mechanism for CJA lawyers to be able to express, you know, to, to share their concerns um, without that fear that somehow they're going to be punished for it. And I don't know how that would function. Uh, and I think educating lawyers about how, how to present your expenses and requests to the court. So another, we had a presentation by one of the magistrate judges a couple of years ago at one of our CLEs. And she was talking about some distrust among the judiciary of CJA billing, where you look at the docket and the docket says this hearing lasted for point, you know, for 15 minutes, and the CJA lawyer bills for an hour and a half. And you know, the, I think the, the assumption was that the CJA lawyer was padding the bill. And I know for myself, there are frequently times when I have a hearing at 9:30, and I sit in court until 10:30, and that's when my case gets called. And so. I think that the difference between that person who is being viewed with suspicion in me is that I'll tell the court, this is when you set my case and this is when you called my case and at that time I was sitting talking to my client, talking to the prosecutor, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I, just, I think that education on both sides of the bench and some mechanism for CJA lawyers to share those concerns without that, that fear of reprisal. Um, and I, you know, in preparing for this, there were lawyers on the panel who shared information with us, again, under the condition that, that it was anonymous. Um, and it's possible that some of those lawyers, if we talked to, would be willing to speak to the committee, but um, I think that there, there is a concern about raising those issues. That's right. Mr. Morris, I wanted to ask you about um, one of the things that you commented on, on the issue of fear and, and just um, voucher cutting. And one of the things that you talked about in your statement and today was this voluntary, or if you will, maybe involuntary voucher cutting, but essentially folks cutting their own vouchers in an effort to avoid further cuts or in an effort to avoid uh, the court uh, looking disfavorably upon them. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you, you learned about that? Well, in the report, I think we cited an instance where there was sort of a, a, a middle ground of that, where the where someone from the clerk's office called a lawyer and said, uh, don't you want to cut this voucher because you know if it goes to the court, he's not going to approve this amount. And if you want it to, to go through, uh, cut it to this amount if, if you want to, you know, take a long time to fight over this, that's your business. And uh, that that's one example. Uh, some of the things that I bring to you. Uh, I talk to a lot of lawyers in my position and they tell me about their experiences and I, I frequently hear that comment that well, I know what this judge will pay so there's no reason for me to go above that and uh, so it's, it's sort of they figure out in the culture of that particular court what that judge believes to be reasonable or what, it, what that judge will pay and, it, and let me say sometimes it's not that much of functional reasonableness. It's a function of what that judge believes will be approved up the up the chain. Is it for that type of case, or Correct. what what a bank robbery is worth, or some kind of reasoning like that. Correct. Mm -hmm. Have you had any um, discussion during the, the report, or with the individuals who worked on the report, about um, attorneys saying that they chose to make these voluntary cuts because they were concerned? not only with whether or not the voucher would be paid, but whether or not it would reflect poorly on them for future appointments. You know, you're asking me if I've had any specific comments, I would have to go back and review all the materials, but I can tell you that, that that's, that's been presented to me as the general feeling that that's another aspect of why they do this, is they don't want to appear to be... Uh, as I said, or they're swimming upstream, and they're, they're concerned that somehow, since that same judge may control uh, the CJA panel, that it will reflect on, impact their ability to get cases in the future. If, if I could just add to that, um, we, we uh, that concern has been, was expressed to NMCDLA in getting ready for this hearing, that uh, especially seeking to go over the statutory maximum, that that would just like you're milking the CJA system, even though you did put in the work. Uh, and we've been talking as a community about how to fix that because 
you know, obviously when someone comes in and underbills, they spend way more hours on a case than they're informing the court, then the court has now an unreasonable expectation of what the defense looks like for particular categories of cases. And so I think that's a real, a real worry for all of us, and I don't know how to address that. Um, again, whether that's just a conversation that we have between the CJA panel and the court, um, but, but I, I worry about that. I worry that judges think that a robbery can always be done underneath the statutory maximum because there are so many people who are just billing under that to, to avoid making waves. Can I ask a follow-up question to Mr. Morris? Mr. Morris, do you know why Austin doesn't have a CJA plan? Yes. Can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> because the judges won't approve one. And, and but, but do you know what um, what the mindset is? I mean, we've heard that other jurisdictions yes. don't. I mean, is, is there a, a, an articulable reason for that? Yeah, in, in preparation for coming here today, I actually called someone who is involved in that system and on agreement that I wouldn't reveal who it is. He told me what the system is. <laughs> uh, everybody in, in Austin that's in the federal bar is subject to getting appointments. Uh, and, and sometimes they do. I get calls from lawyers all the time in civil firms saying, I just got an appointment, what do I do? Uh, but then the, the magistrates have kind of a smaller list that's informal. They've just sort of picked lawyers that they know that they can call on to do particular types of cases. There have been discussion over the years of doing a formal CJA panel, and there's apparently some tension between a philosophy that if you're going to practice in federal court, you need to pay your dues and represent indigent defendants. And the philosophy of this needs to be uh, a very well-run system that will place indigent defense on the same footing as as uh, hired counsel with training and and expertise. And and uh, so it, it's it's basically a battle of philosophies. The, do the CJA, uh, I'm sorry, do the attorneys that are appointed, these civil firm attorneys, do they do it pro, literally pro bono? Do they not bill through the CJA? Do you know? They do bill, and and I've been hired by civil firms to, you know, they're, they're concerned about, you know, ineffective assistance. So they, they would hire me or some of my colleagues to basically co-counsel with them on appointed cases. And But they but then they also bill through the CJA? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Your turn. Okay. <laughs> well, there are yeah, there there are a number of questions, but uh, again, Mr. Morris, uh, been a, involved in a couple of these larger studies in the in the state system, and you go back and you think, I I wish I would have asked these questions. Now, on the uh, on the study that the uh, NACDL uh, performed, uh, if I were to ask you, what would you do differently if you were starting the study now? And, and the reason I ask that is because we are getting all all sorts of uh, anecdotal evidence, which, which we're going to get, and I'm not saying we're going to disbelieve that in, in whatever sense, but we have to make a case at some point in time to the judiciary and probably ultimately uh, Congress um, that's going to have to be supported by, by data. Um, and uh, I haven't seen a lot of data support at this point in time for, for those that would be uh, skeptical or would, or would want to know uh, you know, for example, voucher cutting, how, how often, we know it happens, okay? What circuits does it happen in? Which, which courts? And we don't need to know specifically, but is this happening 95% of the time or 40% of the time? And um, I'm very interested in knowing how to gather that data and what either roadblocks you ran into or what would you do differently that, that you can uh, help us with? Because we'll have, you know, we've had people testify that, you know, voucher cutting it just is not an issue in, in my district. In other ones, it's a huge issue. In other ones, it's not an issue at the circuit court level. In many places, it is. And so how do we gather that data? What would you do differently? Well, the way, it's kind of two parts of your question. The way we gathered the data was to assure anonymity. Uh, again, I, I don't know enough about the workings of your committee to know what your capabilities are in that, in that respect. But there has to be some way to get the same people to talk to you that talk to us. Uh, the but how is that supported statistically? And I'm just making observations. I'm not being critical. But you tell somebody, I went out and interviewed 135 people and gave them anonymity, and this is what they told us. 
it, it's, what, what most people will do with that information? Uh, I don't think it's supported statistically. I don't think that, the, you know, that all the parameters that, that would make a good statistical study were, were observed. Uh, I think if you wanted to support it statistically, then you would have to uh, have some statistically valid model to, to reach out to these folks but then you would still run into the problem of would they talk to you. So you would have to, again, couple that with, with some assurance of anonymity. Um, you know, I noticed the reason the Prado report was rejected was because lack of empirical data. Uh, and I think that's, well, that's, yeah. that's exactly what you're, <laughs> what you're talking about. Uh, so I guess things I would do differently, I guess, or things that I hope we could go back and, and redo, I would like to be able to, to come to you and say, John Doe or Jane Rowe had a voucher cut on you know, X amount. Uh, we, we've cited one example of voucher cutting in a report because that lawyer was particularly upset about it. Uh, that judge had actually sought him out to handle the case. He handled the case, got a not guilty, and his voucher was cut. And uh, so, Somehow we would try to build a model that we could get a statistically valid sample. The, the other thing is we very consciously viewed this as, as a two-step process, as I was saying in my remarks. The first step was to uh, gather information and come up with fundamental recommendations, sort of the, the touchstones of what a system ought to be. We view very much it to be a second phase to determine how to enact or enable those those touchstones, um, and that that would require us going back to the, the public defenders of CEA panel and say, all right, you know, th this is what it's what it's going to consist of. Now, how do where do we put this in in you know the judiciary or separate agency? You know, what do we have a a max system or you know, whatever we come up and I, with. And I'm not, sure, and I don't want to interrupt, I'm not sure we have that luxury. I mean, yeah. that's the problem. If we were to suggest an uh, alternate system, um, I, I think we need to put some parameters as far as A, what it would look like structurally, and B, what's it going to cost, at, uh -huh. at, at least in, in some framework. And um, I, I guess that's what I'm asking. You know, well, I guess the answer is that that part of it's a very, very different process than the first process. You went to step one, but not necessarily to step two. Right. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, could each of you give us any reasons for keeping it under the judiciary? Uh, you know, some say it's protection, you know, to, to, to be able to uh, have the judiciary uh, fighting for them or protecting them, as we talked about with Planned Parenthood. I'd like each of you to give me, uh, or us, one, two, three, any reason that you think it should stay um, under the judiciary. Let's start with you, Mr. Morris. Um, I can give you the argument for why it should be under the judiciary. I, I can't say that I agree with it. And, and I think it's a valid argument is that uh, there's a lot, some that feel that the judiciary does provide cover for the defense function uh, before Congress and getting appropriations. I think that's the, the only reason. And you don't agree with it, why? I, I think that from what I've observed in the last two or three years, um, that there is great support in Congress for the defense function. And that the experience during the sequestration was that the defenders went up and advocated on their own and did quite well with it. Um, so I, I think I think they, the, the defense function could do well in a separate agency advocating on its own. And you don't think those winds could change? Certainly they could. And, and um, <clears throat> if we were to design a system with certainty that that wouldn't happen, I, I don't think we would ever come up with a system. I, I think that's just an errant risk. How about you, Ms. Duncan? You know, it, it's hard for me to think of another reason why, other than that coverage, to keep it under the judiciary. Um, you know, our state experience of moving from, you know, moving our law office as the public defender to a separate entity, although not perfect, I think has really improved the independence of our state public defender. Um, I think it's, 
So yeah, I would say that the I do worry about the winds of public opinion. Um, we've seen those changes here in New Mexico in recent days, um, but I think that. It, independence in the public defender, independence in the defense counsel is critical to effective representation. And I, I am concerned about you know, keeping the defense function under the judiciary and the impact it has on that independence. I think that being under the administrative office of the courts is, is, has been an important um, factor in allowing the defense to be elevated to something that is critical to um, prosecution defense parity. But the what I've heard in the last two days is that, that because of scarcity, that the defense is always going to get um, less than. And so there has to be some independence outside of, has to be well-funded uh, and make sure that it, it isn't um, defunded just because um, we represent unpopular people. Huh. I want to come back to the issue of voucher cutting and ask a question because one of the things that occurs to me as I listen to all of you talk is that if we could somehow perfectly capture the statistical reality of voucher cutting, it might not be adequate. I'm starting to get this picture of the voucher cutting being the tip of the iceberg and the self-editing of requests for experts and the self-editing of advocacy being, you know, what sits below the waterline, it's a bigger and more dangerous problem. And I, I'd like to know what you think about that. Is that an accurate view? Is there any way, you know, we get at that? If, if I may just give you an example, in, in our system in Travis County, the first month that we operated, we had one request for an investigator. Uh, the, the MAC system hires investigators. We have staff investigators who are available to the panel lawyers. The next month we had 17. Uh, and the last report I saw, we've had now hundreds of requests for investigators in the nine months that have been keeping the things been running. I think that reflects what you're saying. There is a, uh, the, the other 10 elevenths of the iceberg there that's it's the cultural uh, issue among defense lawyers of, well, I don't need an investigator, and no need to ask for one anyway. We've actually had to had to give them a not so gentle nudge to to change that culture. Uh, and the other thing, the tip of the iceberg is, I, I, I don't know that that we're talking about a system where a voucher would never be cut again. I think what we're talking about is a system where someone looks at a voucher from a defense perspective and says, I'm going to cut your voucher because you didn't need that service, that's ridiculous what you did, uh, or there's only so much money in the kitty and I'm cutting your voucher because we have two capital cases that are going to trial next month and we just have to have that money for those capital cases. So both of those are examples, I think, of, of how dealing with this from the defense perspective would create a different culture than the way it's been being done now. I would say, you know, I think that the capital defense model is a good one to use in looking at sort of the, the criminal defense overall. Um, in talking to capital, federal capital defenders from around the country, the resources that are available to you for experts just vary wildly um, from district to district. And so when I've gone... This district is pretty good, actually, about giving the defense the support that they need. But I've talked to other lawyers in other states who their their budgets for experts are just ridiculously low. And so, you know, I, I don't want to advocate for a you know one size fits all approach. But having some sort of uniformity or discussion among the judiciary, among the districts, of what what is required in the representation of um, criminal defendants in the federal system would be helpful to sort of elevate that and. I think to help criminal defense lawyers feel more confident in making requests in their own districts. Communication among defense lawyers, um, more formalized communication, I think would help a lot. So I th we've had the same experience here in New Mexico where someone litigates something or introduces a kind of expert testimony into their case, and then once that word gets out, other lawyers sort of jump on that and start litigating those issues or using those experts in their case. So. 
uh, one of the recommendations NMCDLA had was to, to figure out a system for sharing what's happening in our district courts um, with the CJA panel, who's, who's uh, doing Daubert hearings on certain issues, um, not, you know, novel legal issues, novel, novel factual issues, that sort of um, sharing among lawyers, I think, would really help, help with this issue. I would add that the data for voucher cutting, I think, exists at in the in the courts, in the judiciary, um, collecting that information from the judges when they um, make a, a cut. I think would be um, something that that could be requested. Uh, that might have a chilling effect on on the other the other direction, but the data exists. I think one of the things we found is that while the data should exist, it <laughs> well, it exists in its raw form, and someone needs to collect it. Failure to collect it in any way. There that's you go. Feasible. And of course, that was controlled by the judges who cut the vouchers. <laughs> Ms. Duncan, was there any analysis about the difference in the expense or the cost of the, the system when it changed, and and why did, did vouchers go up? Did, did Requests for experts go up. How much did the new structure cost? Is there been any comparison with that? And you mean in the state system? Yeah. If I could just speak to our executive director, do we know? No, not yet. <coughs> All right, your turn. Thanks, Judge Gardner. Um, a question for each of the panelists on sort of um, uh, uh, comparison. Uh, between CJA lawyers and AFPDs. And a couple data points just to set up the question. So, Mr. Morris, in, in your, uh, in the task force's report uh, from a few months ago, you guys included the anecdote from sequestration when at least a number of federal defenders, in whatever fashion, um, communicated to various constituencies. Um, you know, hey, if you cut the federal defender budget, it's actually going to cost you more because judges are going to have to appoint CJA lawyers, and they're not as good, they're not as experienced. It's going to take them a lot more time. You know, we can do it better and more efficient. And and you include that in there, and I'm I'm glad you did because I can tell you from um, my perspective as a as a former U.S. attorney, I, I heard that a number of my colleagues around the country heard it. Putting aside whether it's true or not, but we heard that. And I think judges heard it. I know people on the Hill heard it. So, so sort of data point number one. Number two, the committee's um, website, um, there's posted a 2007 study by Harvard that, that compared outcomes between AFPDs uh, and, and CJA lawyers and uh, found um, in some fashion some uh, difference in outcome where there were higher rates of you know, success I'm using air quotes um, because they, you know, defined it in certain ways. But essentially, you know, if if you if you've been charged with a crime, uh, basically anywhere in the country, you you would want an AFPD defending you rather than a CJ. <coughs> so with those two um, just data points, um, I guess the question is, um, you know, we all I think um, as a committee are bought into the first principle that the 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 system was set up to be a hybrid system between CJA and FPDs. And, and I think the consensus continues to be until we see data to the contrary that that is a good way to go forward. So if in fact there's some, um, even at the margins, uh, diminution or, 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 or difference in, in training, resources, um, experience between the two, um, I, I guess the two questions are number one, um, not to, you know, put you know, particularly the, well, none of you are current uh, 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 FPDs, and I, I, I'm not sure, Mr. Morris, if you ever were, but is, is, there, any, is there any truth to that, uh, number one? And number two, if there is, um, it would seem to me that, that we as a committee would want to make sure that we're making recommendations to provide, you know, resources, training, experience to CJA lawyers to, across the board, uh, you know, provide them the experience to, to um, you know, to, to, so that there's sort of a you know colorblind or organization blind uh, outcome that if you're you know unfortunate enough to be charged with a crime you're thrilled to get either an AFPD or a CJA lawyer you know across the board I would think that would be a good outcome so just curious you know your your thoughts on that I would think that you couldn't paint with that broader brush I don't think you could take uh, generic 
federal public defender office and say that it's better than generic CJA lawyer. I think uh, that to the extent there are disparities in a particular jurisdiction that it would be useful for the committee to look at why there's that disparity. Uh, I would urge, or I would suggest that if there is a disparity that the focus needs to be on elevating the CJA panel to the level of the federal public defender and the way that the ways that, that could be done, and you know, we've discussed a lot of them, you know, the training, selection, uh, supervision, that sort of thing. Uh, but when it comes down to it, uh, there is no escaping the hybrid system. Uh, the, the nature of the federal practice, unless you want to have multiple federal public defenders in a division, uh, there, there's always going to be conflict. I think one of the rarest things in my practice is a single defendant federal indictment. Uh, it just doesn't happen that much. So it's always going to be conflict. And I, I mean, I can only speak to my experience here in New Mexico, and we have an, an excellent federal public defender office, and certainly um, many of the best federal criminal defense lawyers in our state are in that office. Um, but there are also some really great lawyers on the CJA panel as well. I think that the big difference between um, the federal public defenders and CJA and the way to elevate CJA, is, as Jerry was saying, up to the level of the federal public defender is twofold, well, actually threefold. I think one is just a function of experience. The federal public defenders are in court, federal court, all the time. I mean, so they are constantly practicing those skills, and, um, you know, they're, they're incredibly familiar with federal criminal law, whereas members of the CJA panel our cases are diverse. We, you know, we just aren't in court as often as they are, so we're having to re-educate ourselves, I think, more frequently than they do. The other part of it is resources. So one of the, the issues that comes up here in New Mexico, we're a border state. A lot of our federal criminal cases are illegal in, entry cases. And the people who are crossing the border have a lot of their personal property on them when they're arrested, and it's seized by the federal agencies. The federal public defender, as I understand it, in Las Cruces has the resources and the wherewithal to help their clients to get their property back. So when their clients are finally released to go home, they've got money, they have their personal possessions. CJ lawyers, we don't have those kinds of resources, and the judiciary hasn't been willing to fund it. So... If you're an illegal reentry client with property, you're better off with a federal public defender. I mean, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that you have a better chance of getting your property back, so that when you're released, um, you'll you'll have the resources to get home. And if you have a CJA lawyer, you're not going to have that. Professor Grill, any thoughts? I do think that attitude exists, and I do think that there is an air of elitism in and among the, the federal court systems that, that is very divisive. I think that's really unhelpful. Um, what we did, what I did have, I've worked with excellent attorneys um, in the panel bar and in the federal defender's office. In the District of Oregon, uh, the federal defender trained the panel attorneys, and so we had a regular... Um, continuing legal education course on particular issues um, that came out of the Federal Defender's Office. So there was sort of a responsibility to, to train, train panel lawyers. Um, what, what you do have in a Federal Defender system is a solidarity that is critical in this criminal defense work. Being able to go next door and talk to someone who is an expert in um, um, a 2254 case, um, in a death penalty case, in emotions practice with this particular judge is really vital to um, the ef effective and, and adequate representation. And you don't have that um, outside in the panel in the same way that you do um, in, in the federal defender system. Also, in, the, among, in and among the panel, there's such a wide variety um, across the board of people with experience and, and those without. You might also have that in the federal defender system, but it gets covered up because of the um, um, so the insular way that the, the defender system works. Um, so I think training has to happen across the board in and among the defender systems and um, that we should be responsible for tr making sure the panel attorneys have access to the same kind of um, training and solidarity that I exists in, inside of federal defender office. Ms. Duncan, uh, one of the things I was thinking about when you were talking about, um, when we were all talking about reasonableness review, is the other issue that I wanted to 
to ask you about is whether or not uh, you think that there is any any effort on behalf of panel attorneys that, that you may have discussed this with, any effort to choose their issues carefully. For instance, when we were talking about the difference between AFPDs and panel attorneys, I was thinking about the fact that AFPDs can raise an issue that's well settled in their circuit court and in the Supreme Court many times, continue to raise it without any fear that a judge will say under a reasonable review that there is, um, that's frivolous or that they, they're not going to be paid for it. And I've, I was thinking in particular about the Johnson case in which that issue had gone up to the Supreme Court even through the circuits, had gone to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court on a number of occasions had chosen not to find the residual call, clause void for vagueness. But that kept coming up. And I was, and my thoughts are that that may be one of the ways that panel attorneys make their decisions about their cases is that to raise an issue that's already been well settled is a perfect place for a judge to say that's not reasonable. Did you have any um, any conversation about that or any thoughts about it? Um, I, I did have some conversations with panel members about that, um, and that that is a real concern. I, we recognize that, the, that there are issues that will eventually be won because we've raised it the hundredth time and finally it moves forward. And I do think that um, there is some pushback from the judiciary on funding that kind of work. I, you know, some of those motions can just be filed. I mean, some of them, they're sort of raising the issues in the brief bank, sharing pleadings can really help with um, the cost of that. But I do, I do, I do worry about that. Um, I think it's something that when you're exposed to capital training, you know, the, the capital defense lawyers will tell you that you raise every single thing. It doesn't matter. As long as it, it seems unfair to you, even if every single case in the country is against you, you keep raising it. Um, I'd like to see more of that in the non-capital training, training parts, and also I think just to educate the court on funding, because I, I, I do worry about that. I, I think it's true of legal issues, experts, investigators, I mean, all aspects of criminal defense. Mm -hmm. Is this going to seem frivolous because it's not, there's not a statistical probability that it's going to move my case forward or that I'm going to win at this level? Yes. Um, going back maybe to the macro level, uh, again, I'll ask Mr. Morris first, but I would like uh, the comments from, uh, from each of the three of you. Um, you know, we're considering a number of different alternatives uh, here, and we may uh, eventually recommend that the uh, uh, defense function be removed from the judiciary. Um, and, but even if we do, that recommendation may be rejected you know, one, once again. And um, hopefully, hopefully whatever our recommendation is will be persuasive and, and well thought out. But um, if it were to be rejected either in whole or in part, what suggestions uh, what do you have um, if the program remained either in whole or in part uh, within the judiciary? Maybe using the three areas on page five of your testimony, uh, Mr. Morris, in in each of those three broad areas, um, what what suggestions would you have? I know you mentioned um, the Sentencing Commission, the, the FJC, even the uh, the San Mateo County model. I, I guess I'm asking. Uh, because what we'll be putting together is uh, hopefully a broad framework, and the details may have to be worked out later, but we're really concerned about the broad framework. What, uh, what suggestions would you have? Well, the suggestion, you mentioned some of them, would be uh, moving it within the judiciary to, a, to an independent status that would not be under the control of the judges. Uh, if it remains under the AO, of course, we'd like to see the, the DSO re-elevated, and then just kind of on the on the micro level, uh, some of the things we've talked about: uh, voucher approval, appointment of experts, appointment of investigators, uh, composition of the CJA panels. There, there are already jurisdictions where moves have been made to take those out from under the judiciary, and and uh, you know that would be you know a good halfway measure to to eliminate those inherent conflicts. And I understand you're not advocating that, but I'm sure you know, I'm, I'm looking at alternatives as we as we move down the road. So. And I, I can tell you the happiest people in Austin about the MAC system are the judges. Yeah. Um, I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> and why do you say that? 
well, I say that because I've, I've talked to each of them individually, and they've told me that, but the reason that they say that is that they didn't realize how much of their time it was taking to do that, how how much of uh, an inherent conflict it was. You know, they had somebody in their court of the trial that really irritated them, and then they come up with, with a voucher. You know, it was just impossible to keep that from seeping into their thinking. Uh, and, of course, a, a problem that the federal judges wouldn't have is if a voucher was cut, uh, there was generally a lot of dropping by chambers and whining about it that that took up a lot of time. And I'm not talking about formal reviews, but just, just informal contact with the judge. And that, but first, I think first and foremost, they they really began to worry about the inherent conflict it was position it was putting them in to to have uh, control over who got appointments and how much they were paid. And they also had no uh, effective way to know to to evaluate the lawyers to determine who would get appointments. They saw them in their court. It, it was just a slice of their overall practice. They had no idea what their uh, what the rest of their practice was like, how many other cases they had. You know, we have case law limits now. No, no part, case, okay. case limits now. Yeah. Part, part of the pushback that uh, that we would get, or at least that we would have to answer is, um, of course, under a system like that, we would have the, in some sense, the, the fox guarding the, the hen house. And what, uh, I guess to follow up on Mr. Kahn's question earlier, what what type of Backup system. How do how do we answer that? Yeah, as a committee, the the ultimate the ultimate review of our system is by the county commissioners. The the nonprofit organization has a contract. We're, we're the contract defender for Travis County. Um, so it would be whoever was in control of that. If you were completely independent, then that would be congressional oversight, essentially, or but, but possibly yeah, it would be something like that. But but I think. The foxes guarding the in-house, certainly that's that's a concern. What you have to do is pick the very best foxes you can find. Okay. And how many, I'm not sure of the size of that program, how many attorneys are involved? 228, <coughs> I think, at the last count, the last count I got. And is there a public defender office also? There's a specialized public defender office, two of them. There's a mental health public defender and a juvenile public defender, um, which, uh, you know, they handle... Quite a few cases. And do you have also have a conflict officer? Is it completely then go to what would be the equivalent of our CJA panel? Uh, it, it would go. The, the MAC is equivalent CJA panel. We don't view uh, lawyers within the MAC having co-defendants as being conflict because they're basically independent contractors. There isn't a because yeah, some of those systems do have right. a conflict office, and then it goes to the MAC. And so, okay. Right. Um, Ms. Duncan. Um. I guess the one recommendation that I would have is for someone who does have that criminal defense experience to be involved in the voucher system, you know, if it's something, whether there's a dispute or even not a dispute, to be able to talk to the judge or the judges about specific issues. So whether that's someone within the federal public defender office, if it's a committee, but I, I do think that that is, um, it's, it's a, a piece that's missing, that's, in, that's critical to have someone who knows, who knows how it works to be able to Look at some, look at a particular entry and say the yes, essence is reasonable, or you know, the arguing that the 18 USC as a whole is, has never been enacted is not. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think I, I just I think that any any indigent criminal defense system has got to have oversight by criminal defense lawyers or people who are experienced in indigent, indigent criminal criminal defense. Professor Creel. I want to tell the committee that I've thought about this a lot, um, not in terms of um, the voucher system and, and federal court specifically, but how to set up a defender system because tribes um, are, are creating justice systems that are um, patterned after the adversary system of the United States and state courts. And so it's always a question on who, who pays and how, how they get paid. And so independence is, is critical. I agree, and I would agree with um, Mr. McHugh yesterday that um, the system we have now is anachronistic in that it was set up because that was the way it was set up, not because it was it was thoughtful. And having judges sign vouchers is um, just inherently wrong and should be, if, if nothing else happens, that, that should be removed out from under the, the judges, whether they're circuit or district judges. I want to ask, um, this is, 
assuming we end up, any of the changes we're talking about as we talk about these big changes are really going to require action by Congress. They're statutory changes. And let's assume best case, everyone supports them and it goes forward. We're talking years before they take place. So that, that being the case, you, you surveyed the entire nation. You were looking at the entire system. Are there districts that you see as models uh, within the current statutory structure that we have to deal with and that we could move towards that change while we seek bigger change? You know, I'd have to get back to you with an answer on that. Uh, I think uh, I would want to talk with the task force and, and see if they have a recommendation along those lines. It'd be helpful if you did. Yeah. Okay. You Good will question. be invited to our next hearing. <laughs> <laughs> our next representative is welcome to address us with that answer. <laughs> so we can hold your feet to the fire. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but just, you know, so it's all in the record uh, for Mr. Gould. Um, obviously, the current CJA hourly rate is $127 an hour. Uh, there had been a recommendation internally to raise it to 144. Is there anybody on the panel who doesn't believe that CJA lawyers should be paid at least $144? I take that as a no. Is there anybody <laughs> who thinks um, who has done either you know back of the cocktail napkin or, or more um, you know more involved analysis as to whether that 144 should be a good bit, you know, should be somewhat higher reflecting, you know, current macroeconomic factors and comparisons to, you know, other, other parts of the profession, et cetera. Just curious if, if there's a few that, that that number actually needs to be north of 144. Well, I, I run a law office for 38 years, and I, I'm pretty, pretty well aware, painfully aware, I guess I would say, about how much it costs. And I don't see, in, in order for someone to handle primarily CJA cases, uh, they'd have to handle a lot of them, and they would have to have a very stripped down operation to make ends meet at that level. That's significantly lower than the going rate, for example, in Albuquerque for a private criminal defense lawyer. I mean, that's at least $100, more than $100 less than what you would get paid in a private case. I think you can look to the numbers, but it, in more importantly, look to the experience that, that we've been talking about that's required to defend someone in a, in a federal case, and that is um, significantly more expensive than $144 an hour. Mr. Brooks? Oh, yes, we are. Okay. Um, let me ask each of you, and we'll start with you this time, Mr. Morris. Um, anything um, that you would like to tell us it, it, that that you feel we should hear, um, we'd like to give you the opportunity to give as well. Since I took so long the first time, I'll make this short. <laughs> independence, independence, independence. All right, Ms. Duncan. No, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with all of you. We appreciate it. And Professor Creel. Yes, thank you. Um, as happens in Indian country, um, things progress without uh, paying attention to the Indian individual that might be coming up um, before federal courts. And what has happened in, in um, this unprecedented um, movement towards crime and punishment on the reservation under the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010 and, and the Violence Against Women Act in 2013 is appropriate for um, the trust responsibility of the federal government, but has, is left behind um, the Indian individual um, who is subjected to the federal courts and sentencing. Um, what I would r request um, that you walk away with is, is thinking of that um, Native American criminal defendant, not just in federal court, but in tribal court. And tribal law is important because it's the appropriate place where these um, crimes should be adjudicated. But also, federal attorneys need to know tribal law because of um, federal habeas review. And there aren't, I don't know any attorneys that are experts in 25 U.S.C. 1303. I've litigated a number of um, cases where we're, we're addressing the rights under the Indian Civil Rights Act of the Indian individual in federal court. And that requires a, a depth of knowledge that needs to be present um, among the, the federal bar, um, those practicing and representing Native Americans. All right. 
It's about 1.15. We're going to break for an hour. We will resume at 2.15, so everyone has an hour. And for those that are watching, we'll be back.